theme of our great high priest. And our theme is drawn from Hebrews chapter 10. Let us draw near through our great high priest. Now, in the scriptures, the Lord Jesus Christ is portrayed as having many different roles. He is, of course, one with the Father sitting on his right hand. And he always spoke at the Gospel of John of him going to the Father. He is our Lord. He is the head of his body, as Paul emphasises in Ephesians 1 and 4. As he depicts himself in the Apocalypse in chapter 1, I walk in the middle of the ecclesias. I am observant of everything that goes on in the lampstands. He presents himself in Revelation 3 as a king, sharing the Father's throne already in prospect to be king of the world. And in the Song of Solomon and other passages, he's presented to us as our bridegroom, to whom we are betrothed. And he is also at the Father's right hand as our great high priest. Now, when we focus on his high priesthood, it is clear that we are focusing on just one aspect of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ today. And yet it is a very important role that he is in heaven for us. And there's two things we want to focus on this weekend. Why should we think about Christ as our great high priest? Because it affects our present relationship with him. Hebrews 9.24 he now presents himself in the face of God for us. He is there for our need. And secondly, because of our future relationship with Christ. He is coming as the king of the world and as the priest of the age to come. He will be the high priest of the whole world. And in Revelation 20 and verse 6, in God's grace, we are described as being priests of God and of Christ, working under that order of Melchizedek with Christ as its head. And on Monday morning, God willing, we will explore that future relationship. Now, the idea of Christ as our high priest is there in the foundation doctrines in the BASF. And I don't know whether any of you young people studying for baptism or recently baptised spent much time in clauses 13 and 14. I must confess I don't always spend much time with candidates here. But clause 13 is about Christ as the priestly mediator between God and man. This is a foundation doctrine of the Christian open community. And he is gathering from among the nations a people who should be saved by the belief and obedience of the faith. I'm not entirely happy with the wording of that clause, but uh, don't tell anyone at Cumberland, and I'll explain on Monday why. Clause 14, he is priest over his house only. He does not intercede for the world or for professors, people who profess their religion, who are abandoned to disobedience. Christ makes intercession for his erring brethren if they confess and forsake their sins. It's a foundation belief of us as Christ's brethren. Now, of course, over the years, followers of Christ had to contend with groups of men claiming to be priests. And it's 500 years ago, in his confession from prison, Balthazar Hubmeyer said, My Lord Jesus Christ, quoting Hebrews 2, There you sit mighty and strong to help all believers who set their trust, comfort and hope in you and cry to you in all their needs. It is vain to seek another advocate. And the early brethren had to contend with the Catholic Church who claimed that they had priests. And the view of our brethren was the view of the Bible. There can only be one great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And part of the reason for that, we know, is that our great high priest, to be a great high priest, 
He is immortal. You can't have a true mortal priest. Priests after the order of Melchizedek are immortal. And throughout the book of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul emphasizes the immortality of our Lord. And because he's immortal, he can never sin again. He is absolutely glorious on the Father's right hand. So chapter 4, verse 14, he talks about how Christ has passed through the heavens. In chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, we'll consider tomorrow he's been made perfect. In chapter 6, verse 10, he's entered, even Jesus made a high priest in heaven immortal. Thanks, Brother Jonathan. You must know I'm a thirsty speaker. Yep. 9.24, he's entered heaven. Chapter 10, verse 20 and 21, he's passed through the veil as our high priest. And by type, he's presented as the immortal, sinless son of God at the Father's right hand. Well, let's start with the basics. And the children might think, what does this word priest mean? In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word Cohen just means a principal officer. But of course, it became used of a principal officer in the service of God. In the Greek language, the priest meant someone who is in charge of sacrifices. And God willing, on Monday, we'll see that that's largely the task that God will give the priests of the future age. Now, when I started exploring this topic, I expected that we'd find this term high priest all the way through the law of Moses. That it would be a common term in the scriptures. Well, it's not really at all. In fact, in the law, the term high priest is only used in Leviticus 21 verse 10 of the high priest not being involved in death. And in Numbers 35 in the book of Joshua, for the high priest dying in the cities of refuge. Never used elsewhere in the law of Moses. Used very commonly in the historical books from Samuel to Chronicles and after the exile in the Minor Prophets and Ezra and Nehemiah. There is another term we find in the Old Testament, which is priest messiah. In fact, the first occurrence of the word Messiah in the Bible is in relation to the priest who is anointed. And interestingly, it's used of the priest as a sinner who is anointed, who is supposed to be emulating and demonstrating the qualities of the great anointed. Now, in the New Testament, we have this term chief priests occurs 106 times, but I think it was William Tyndale 500 years ago got to the book of Hebrews and started translating it, high priest. But it's just one word. I think Tyndale wanted to put a differentiator between those chief priests under the law and the high priest, Jesus Christ. But it's one word. He is the chief priest, the head of all the other priests. And you can see in the Greek word, the word arch, the chief, the head. He is in Hebrews 4 verse 14 called the great chief priest. And this greatness is because he excels any other priest that came in shadow under the law or in actual fact in the days of his, Jesus' ministry. So the word chief priest occurs 106 times in the historical books of the New Testament from Matthew to Acts. Only once of a faithful man, Abiathar, and 17 times in Hebrews. I once read that Jesus Christ as the high priest is only found in Hebrews and in Psalm 110.4 in Zechariah 6, verse 12 to 15. When you explore the Bible, there's lots of references to Christ 
our great chief priest. In the section we look at right at the end, Jesus Christ is called the great priest in Hebrews chapter 10. Now, we will spend a lot of time in Hebrews because it is obviously an important topic of the book of Hebrews. Brother John Martin says, it's the major theme of the epistle, that of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Or Brother Barling says, it's the grand distinctive theme of the epistle, the high priesthood of Christ. So priests are very important in Hebrews. The word priest occurs 32 times. And if you turn to Hebrews chapter 7, there's a verse you probably know well, but it's worth reminding ourselves of. And verse 12. The priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. The priesthood was changed from the system of Aaron to the order of Melchizedek. So, says the apostle, there must be a change of the law. And his point clearly is, the law of Moses was built around the priesthood. The centre of it was the priesthood. It wasn't the priest built around the law, but the law built around the priesthood. If the priesthood changes, the law must change. Now for the Hebrews, they were at a critical juncture in their lives. They had to make a choice. And their choice simply was, were they going to go forward with the Lord Jesus Christ or were they going to go back to the law? Were they going to be fixated upon the rituals and the procedures in the temple of Jerusalem and salvation by achievement by the law or were they going to continue to go forward with the Lord Jesus Christ? And for them... It was a life or death decision. Would they choose the Melchizedek high priest? For us, brothers and sisters, the choice is not that different. Are we going to go forward with Christ or are we indeed going to go back to the world from which Christ has extracted us? We must make the decision. Now, while the Hebrews are thinking... We still want to be involved in the temple worship. Well, look, our family and friends are all going down there and killing animals and the priests are making sacrifices and, and we can't give this up. And yes, Christ is there, but, but we cannot forsake the law given to our fathers. At this very time, the priesthood was totally corrupt. When we went to Jerusalem with the Evanses a few years back, we stopped and took some photos. And does anyone recognise the handsome young gentleman on the right? A famous archaeologist who was digging up the high priest's house is Brother Lane Ripmeyer in his youth. And he was uncovering the grandeur of the high priest's house. Well, at least Lane thinks it's the high priest's house. Not everyone agrees with him. But here they were with the impending doom of their city, with the destruction of the temple and all the things they knew, and here's the high priest building an opulent place to dwell in. These days, of course, it's many metres under the surface of Jerusalem. But you can go there and look at the mosaics and the impressive structure that would have been there in Jesus' day, and presumably where the trial of Jesus took place. But the priests by this day were nothing like Aaron. To sum them up, they were money-grabbing, corrupt, unmerciful crooks, and that would be polite to them. And if you look at the list of priests from the time Jesus was born until the destruction of Jerusalem, they were just an unremitting display of fleshly, carnal men. So if you look 
in the time of Jesus was Joseph Caiaphas, the son-in-law of Annas or Ananus. He was the high priest. And following Caiaphas were four other sons of Ananus. Uh, Jonathan in 36 to 37, Theophilus 37 to 41, Matthias in 43, Jonathan comes back in 44. And when the city's about to be destroyed, when Paul is writing this letter in 63, you'll notice that another Ananus, son of the Ananias, when Jesus was there, is now the high priest, a corrupt man of a corrupt father. And yet, they're hankering after going back to this corrupt religious system from which Christ has rescued them. And you'll be aware that in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, he wants to go and get his five brothers. And Ananias had five sons and his sons-in-law, but they would not believe the simple truth of the gospel. So, when Jesus gave the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, we don't need to turn this up, but in verse 31, the priest walks down the road, sees the man lying there in his misery and walks straight on. And Jesus is not making some unfair caricature of the priests. That was how the priests were regarded. Unmerciful, uncaring, dedicated to their own religious holiness and not really interested in the needs of the people at all. And that was exactly what the priesthood was like. Well, let's turn to that from what God intended the priest to be. And for a few moments tonight, I want to look at the priest who is able to succour and care for people. And so I want to now look at four scenes of chief priests that genuinely care. Two in the Old Testament and two of our Lord Jesus Christ in the New. These are patterns for us of what caring priests are truly like. So let's go back to the first priest of the Bible, Melchizedek. Genesis chapter 14. Now, of course... It's a sub, the Melchizedek priesthood is a subject in itself. And if you're really interested, there's a fantastic series on YouTube by Brother Jim Cowie on the Melchizedek priesthood. And Brother Jim explains how Abraham had gone north and fought the kings of the north in a time of Armageddon and had returned to Jerusalem and he meets Melchizedek. Amazing type, amazing prophecy of what God will accomplish and clearly a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you just to sit back and think about the story from Melchizedek and Abraham's viewpoint. Abraham is returning from the slaughter of the kings. He is a shaken man. We know that. Chapter 15, verse 1, Yahweh appears to him and says, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. I know the trauma you've been through, Abraham. I know how frightened you've been in having a man who's used to herds and tents going and fighting the Confederate armies of the north. I understand. I am thy shield. I'll be with you. I will protect you. I am thy exceeding great reward. But before he receives that promise of God, he is met by Melchizedek, king of Salem. And we understand what this represents as king of righteousness of the city of peace. And he brings out bread and wine. He brings out a meal of fellowship and establishes these two symbols, which are going to be fundamental to the law of Moses in the meal offering and the drink offering. And he is the priest of the Most High God. And he comes out to reach out to Abraham and enjoy fellowship. Now, Brother Carter points out that in addition, he probably 
supported Abraham in the potential engrossment and entrapment by the king of Sodom. Brother Carter expresses it this way. When the king of Sodom is going to offer him his spoil, the acceptance of the spoil might have carried some obligation to the king of Sodom or led to an undesirable association. Lot's intimacy with the cities nearly cost him his life and, and his family. Any compromising connection on Abraham's part was avoided by the meeting with Melchizedek and the encouragement to separateness he then received. So he enjoyed fellowship. He had chased these armies north. He comes back weary, frightened, and Melchizedek extends to him a meal of fellowship which points forth to the glorious things God will provide. And he supports him in the potential problem of the king of Sodom that he might not fall in this hour of potential weakness. The next Melchizedek priest, I think, is David. And the day, which is celebrated in the Psalms, the day when David takes the ark to Zion. And here is another Melchizedek priest reaching out for his people. Let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 6. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, we find David enacting the role of the priest. And he is bringing the ark to Zion. And we know how often he commemorated that in the Psalms, of the Psalms. So he heard that, in verse 12, Yahweh had blessed the house of Edom. He went up and brought up the ark of God from the house of Edom into the city of David with gladness. A central role of the priests was going to bring joy to the nation. He's wearing the linen ephod, we are told, and he's dancing and shouting. As, in fact, in verse 14, he dances with all his might and he's girded with the linen ephod. He is truly the Melchizedek priest. And as the ceremony comes to an end and the ark is safely brought into the tent that he establishes on Mount Zion, he brings it in verse 17 into the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. So he set up a house of God, this simple tent, which was representative of Yahweh dwelling against, amongst men. And we know how the tabernacle of David then has repercussions into Amos 9 and Acts chapter 15. And he offers there in verse 17 burnt offerings and peace offerings. Not sin and trespasses, offerings of dedication, burnt offerings of dedication and peace offerings of fellowship. And as he concludes in verse 18, he blesses the people. Exactly the same way as Melchizedek blessed Abraham. The greater blessing the lesser. And just as Melchizedek had extended blessing in the name of Yahweh, here is David blessing and giving comfort to his people. And in verse 19, he deals among all the people, just as the Lord would later say, drink ye all of it. He brings the whole nation in fellowship to God. And then in chapter 7, he sits down before Yahweh in the tent. David walked into the tent before the ark and sat down as the priest in Yahweh's presence. Such was his intimacy with his God. And then later on, he prophesies of the Melchizedek priest. As Jesus says, David in spirit, through his concentration on the mind of God, calls 
Jesus, his Lord, he understands he is Lord and he understands that he is the Melchizedek priest. And so we can compare the attitude of Melchizedek in reaching forward to his people, to Abraham, with David reaching forth to the nation. It was a time of defeat of their enemies. Abraham had destroyed the great confederation from the north. David had been given rest from all his enemies. Melchizedek is king of Salem, a term used in Psalm 86 verse 2 of Christ when he rules in peace. David is king of Jerusalem and it cannot be accomplished till he is king in Jerusalem. And 2 Samuel 6 must follow 2 Samuel 5. He's in Jerusalem. Melchizedek brings forth bread and wine. David brings forth, in, in, um, in this chapter, in verse 19, he brings forth bread, a good piece of flesh, and what's called in the King James, a flagon of wine. Well, it wasn't wine. It was probably a bunch of dried grapes. As we might think of sultanas or something. But it was the fruit of the vine. He gives them the bread and of the vine and a piece of flesh, which would have been part of the peace offerings as the nation is drawn into fellowship. Melchizedek has fellowship with one. David has fellowship as priest with the whole nation. Immediately following the story of Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham is given the promise of a seed from his own bowels. It seems almost immediately in the record, 2 Samuel 6 is followed by 2 Samuel 7. David is given a promise of his seed from his own bowels, from his literal line. And David in Genesis, uh, Abraham in Genesis 15 was taught righteousness by faith. He was declared righteous by faith. And David is to be taught righteousness by faith. Not of works of flesh, because he would fall dreadfully. But he was to learn as their high priest that righteousness is imputed by faith. So in these two Old Testament scenes, we have this willingness of the priest to rise to the need, to succor and care, whatever the circumstance. In 2 Samuel 6, David himself had been through a period of great sadness at the death of Uzzah, but now he had galvanized the nation with joy and dancing and great singing to bring the ark to Zion. All right, then let's turn to two scenes from the Melchizedek priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the book of Hebrews. And what we see again is a priest ready to rise to our need. We know this section of Hebrews perhaps principally from verse 14. Christ's identity with those he came to save. He took part of the same. We know how the apostle labours this point. He was like us. They, verse 11, who are sanctified and they who are sanctified of all are one. There's a commonality between Jesus and his brethren. Verse 12, he will declare his name unto his brethren. and One day he will stand as the priest in the temple, verse 12, and in the midst of his saved will sing praise unto his God. What a glorious scene that will be, brothers and sisters. How do you want to be there? To hear the Lord Jesus Christ lift his voice in praise to God for his brethren. And I'm sure that's what the song's going to be about. He'll be thanking God for his brethren, the many sons and daughters he had brought to glory. Verse 13, he quotes, I will put my trust in him. And a very obscure quote from Isaiah, Behold, I and the children which God hath given me. And in that sense, 
He is not just our priest, he is also our father. So of course, in verse 14, we are like unto him that through death, through possessing the same sinful disposition that we have, by entering sin's arena, he might conquer sin and deliver, in verse 15, those who through fear of death had all their lifetime been subject to bondage. So he says in verse 16, he took not on him the nature of angels. Most of us have this nature of angels uh, crossed out and we know that the Greek really means to take hold of angels. And yet clearly the idea is his identification with those of mortal flesh he came to save. He is not connected with angels. He did not come to save them and partake of their likeness. He came in the nature of men. And he calls it here the seed of Abraham. You know, all these Jews ready to go back to the law. And Paul says, look, your saviour came as the seed of Abraham to fulfil all those promises made to Abraham in the very nature which you bear that he might overcome and be triumphant over sin. And therefore, we come to this word, wherefore, in verse 17. In all things, it behoved him. He was indebted to be like his brothers. Jesus willingly bore the same nature as us, the tiredness, the frustration, the sickness, the lack of energy that comes upon all of us, the temptation to sin, that he may be like unto his brethren, a merciful and faithful high priest. And we are told by the lexicographers that the word merci merciful here, merciful and faithful high priest, means active compassion. Not, as Vine puts it, not simply possessed of pity, but actively compassionate. Our Lord sits on the Father's right hand tonight and he's actively compassionate for us in our failings. He knows where today we fell short of his glory. He knows the most innermost thoughts of his mind and he's reaching out for our need. He's a merciful chief priest. And he's also faithful. And this becomes a really key idea in Hebrews. He is reliable. We can trust him. Our salvation's not going to disappear. When we're in trouble, he will reliably be there. And the word is used, for example, in Hebrews 10 and verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. He is reliable and dependable. Well, chapter 11, verse 11 speaks of Sarah. Because she viewed God as faithful. He wouldn't let her down. The baby would be born according to to the time of life. He is merciful to us. He is faithful and just to his Father. He is merciful and faithful in things pertaining to God. Yes, he's there for our need, but he does exactly the Father's will. He's not like these so-called priests of today, the mealy mouths, who just let anything go. Just ignore all sins and let's all be chums. He is a man who is faithful to his God and his goal to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. The primary thing the Lord will do is for our sins to be forgiven. And the word reconciliation here is only used in one other place in the Bible. It's in Luke chapter 18 and verse 13. Let's just briefly go back to this little parable with the sinner coming into the temple. The tax, 
to collect a stanza far off. He wouldn't lift his eyes so much unto heaven. He smites his breast and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says in verse 14, this man went down to his house justified rather from the other because he humbled himself. This is the very word Paul uses here. He makes mercy, reconciliation, a way of forgiveness open for the sins of the people. Of course, that all conjures up the high priest under the law who into the shadow offered sacrifices for the sins of the people as we shall see in his study, later in our study. He forgives our sins. He brings mercy to us. But even more in verse 18, he is not a passive high priest, for he himself suffered through his time of testing. He is able to succor them. And we know the Greek word means to run to the cry. He's always listening. Our Lord Jesus Christ is always alert to our need. And a point we'll make on Monday morning, he is our intercessor. This is not just when we pray. He is our intercessor all the time, constantly seeking for our well-being. And when we go through temptation and when we fail, he is there to uphold us and to support us to run to the cry of our need. The last scene we'll look at tonight is from Hebrews chapter 4, when, when Paul introduces the high priesthood in its fullness. And he has explained in chapter 3 the failure of Israel in the wilderness and that Joshua did not truly give them rest. And so he says to them in verse 11 of chapter 4, let us labour to enter into that rest. Let any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So his stress here is on failure because they didn't believe. He ends chapter 3 with this statement in verse 19. They couldn't enter the land because of unbelief. And now he turns to contemplate the work of our high priest in bearing with our weakness. And he starts off with these words in verse 12. The word of God is living and energetic. And we think, yes, the word of God is incredibly living and energetic to work in our lives. But by the time we get to verse 13, we read, all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him. Christ, with whom we have to do. So we start off with the word in verse 12, and by the time we get to 13, it's Christ, the word made flesh. And truly, in the greater sense, it is our great high priest who opens us up and whose words are living and energetic to open us up. I think we understand the figure which is being deployed here by Paul, is the burnt offering. So what did you do with the burnt offering? Read the Leviticus chapter 1. You bring in your burnt offering and you flay it. That is, you get rid of the skin. And then you open it up. You examine the animal for imperfections because it must be a perfect offering. And then... As you open it up, you separate the head from the legs from the body and you lay it in order upon the altar. And as it consumes, this represents your life given to God. Well, who can do that? We all have areas of our life that we do not give to God. But Paul says what we need is the sharp, dagger of the word of God to expose our imperfections. For were the animal to have one imperfection, it would be thrown away. It would be a useless offering. But our Lord Jesus Christ 
as our high priest is much more sympathetic with our failings than that. Now, you would have heard probably Brother Darren Taporis expounding verses 12 to 16 as a picture of the judgment seat. And truly, at the judgment seat, the Lord will lay everything bare. There will be all the inner thoughts, all the emotions will all be exposed. All the things that we hid from everyone else will be out there in the open. But the Lord is doing this for us today. We don't wait for the judgment. We do this right now. The word of God, he says, is sharper than any two-edged sword. Penetrating to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit. And you've probably heard this expounded, but what is soulish is fleshly. This word soulish is used in Jude and in James 3 for what is basically fleshly or carnal. The Lord searches the heart and he divides the fleshly, the soulish, from the spiritual. He opens up the joints and marrow. Now the high priest under the Lord never explored the joints and marrow. Our Lord Jesus Christ explores the marrow, the seat of where the blood is manufactured. He understands what's going in the minute workings of our brain. He is, says the apostle, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In the Greek, of course, it is the kritikos, the critic. He is the critic of our thoughts and intents maybe more exactly as we have on the PowerPoint, the, the, the word thoughts in thermesis means the reasonings. He understands all the rationale, all the justifications, all, the, all those logic, false logic that we encumber our brains with. But he also understands the intents, the ideas, all the ideas that go through our brain and we settle on. So in verse 13, there is no creature that is not open and manifest in his sight. All things are naked. The burnt offering is skin. Everything is exposed. It's open. And this, of course, you, you will have heard, is when they cut the neck open and they push the neck back and they looked into the centre of what that animal was. That's what the Lord does for us. All things are open to his eyes. Our great high priest misses nothing. Under the law, they may have missed some imperfection. Our Lord is fully aware. So he says in verse 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest. The only occurrence of that phrase in the Bible he is a great priest, just as later on in chapter 13, he talks about a great shepherd. In chapter 2, about a great salvation. And during his ministry, he said, a greater than Solomon is here. The Lord indeed is a great priest. But he's also the chief priest, the one who is the head of the order of Melchizedek. Seeing we have such a man who is now passed, literally in the Greek, through the heavens. He's gone beyond the heavens of the Jewish law. He's passed beyond that. He's now at the right hand of God. He calls him Jesus, just Jesus. He's been talking about Joshua. Now there is Jesus who is in the heavens, and he is the son of God. How did he succeed? Because he is God's son. He said, us, let us hold fast our confession. Don't go back, brothers and sisters and young people. Don't be drawn back to what we have left. Let us hold fast our confession. Why? We say it's, it's too hard. I fail too often. I'm too weak. How am I ever going to succeed to get there? Because our high priest 
cannot be touched. We do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And you will probably have a note in your margin that those words cannot be touched are the words in, in this the one Greek word, sympatheo. He is sympathetic. He is totally sympathetic. He fully understands our circumstance. He cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Literally in the Greek, our lack of strength. Jesus Christ, as he sits on the right hand of God, is aware of the lack of strength of every one of us. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our failings. He knows our inability to overcome. So in verse 16, let us, he says, this man, for him, he understands in verse 15, because he was in all things tested like as we are, yet without sin. Here is the sinless man who struggled against the same three lusts that we have, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, yet he stood apart from sin. He was never embroiled in sin. So verse 16, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a reasonable or seasonable time. Let us seize the advantage of having a wonderful high priest and come before a throne of mercy. And of course, this takes us back to the law of Moses, where they had the, on the mercy seat a crown of gold. And it was like a throne where once a year the high priest would bring his blood. But Christ has entered heaven. And we now have a throne of grace, a continual mercy seat that we may approach to freely at any time and find mercy and grace to help. You know, the chief priest we serve is a man of immense care who wants to succour and save his beloved. Now, the theme of our weekend comes from Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 21 and 22. Now, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17, and 18. The apostle comes to the climax of his argument. For in verse 3, he said that the sacrifices and bulls and goats, in them there is remembrance again made of sins every year. Verse 4, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. When he comes to verse 17 and 18, he says, the day is coming when the prophecy of the new covenant of Jeremiah will be fulfilled. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. It's all finished, says Paul. No need to go down to the temple and start killing bulls and goats. They won't do you any good. The Lord's come. Our sins and iniquities will be remembered no more. There's no more offering for sin. He's done it. It's all accomplished. He made one offering for sin, he tells us, and he's now sat down at the right hand of God. Well, what's the implication? So in verse 19, the apostle starts the moral and exhortation, moral implications and exhortation for us. Having therefore, brethren, boldness, boldness, freedom of speech, confidence, we have confidence to enter into the holiest because Christ has led us into the very presence of God. It's a new and living way which he has consecrated in verse 20 through the veil. That is his flesh. When he died, the veil was rent. The way was open into the holiest of all. He gave his flesh that we might have entry into the very presence of God. And also in verse 21, 
we have a high priest over the house of God. So on these two indisputable facts, the veil was torn open. He gave his life. He entered heaven. And he is now our high priest over the house of God. And here we are as that house. What can we do? Verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. And you will have marked out, no doubt, in your Bible that in verse 22 we have faith, in verse 23 we have hope, and in verse 24 we have love. The presence of a great priest at God's right hand should evoke from our hearts faith, hope, and love. It should cause us, in verse 22, to draw near with absolute confidence, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. Tomorrow morning, we'll explain that phrase from the law, and I'm going to re relate that to the leper, and God willing, talk about our need as lepers to have our bodies sprinkled with blood, and then our bodies washed. So our plan, if God is willing, in the next couple of days, is tomorrow morning's first session, we will look at our need. Us as lepers, we're all dying, we're all disfigured, we're all unclean, but the high priest steps in to fix our problem. And we don't value our high priest until we truly appreciate our need. And God willing, tomorrow morning's study will think about our need. The second study, God willing, we will talk about our Lord Jesus Christ, why he is the perfect high priest based on Hebrews 5 and 7. What is it about this man that constitutes him the great high priest in the heavens? On Sunday morning, God willing, we will think about his blood. As the high priest, he is both the offering and the priest. He has entered heaven with his own blood and he is there now for us. And particularly on Sunday morning, we want to pick up this idea from Hebrews 9 that Christ purges our conscience. He cleanses our conscience. He cleanses all the innermost thoughts that we find difficulty with. He cleans them all as our great high priest. Monday morning, God willing, we will look at mediator, advocate and intercession. I thank the Stirling and Districts Ecclesia for practising these studies on them over the last five weeks. And particularly Brother Stuart Worm provoked me to get into the idea of mediator, advocate, intercessor and reconcile it. So, We'll cover that on Monday morning, God willing. How does Christ forgive our sins? And finally, in study five, on Monday morning, we'll go into the kingdom. And our title out of Revelation 20, verse 5, is Priests of God and of Christ. We will see Christ not principally as the king of the future age, but as a Melchizedek priest both king and priest, reigning in righteousness. And with him, there's a great order of Melchizedek. He is calling us to be part of that great throng of priests who collaborate with him in the worship of the age to come. And hopefully we will end our Monday with a positive vision of the Lord Jesus Christ's role for us if we respond to his priesthood. May God be with us all as we contemplate and draw near through our great high priest.